doesn't take a whole lot to change your life. You don't have to make big changes. That's a false belief that stops us from making any effort. Oh, my life just needs to change. Not a whole lot. It's not a whole lot. I mean, no, you can barely miss a, uh, a telephone post, but at least you missed it. You missed it. So it doesn't take a whole lot to create favorable changes or what I would call improvements in your life. And I felt stirred, and I called you, and I hope you got my phone call about it, that today's focus would be how to improve your life in 24 hours. I don't have 50 years to improve my life. I did years ago, but I don't anymore. I don't have 25 years to improve my life. So how can you improve your life in 24 hours? Remember, feelings are important. After all, everything we do is for a feeling. They are important. We'll never, never play down your feelings. Never trivialize your feelings. But we know that they can change in a moment. You can be on a downer and one meaningful conversation can change your whole picture of your life. Feelings are very changeable. And you may feel like, you know, my life is going nowhere. Nothing's really changing. Nothing's improving. Nothing's happening in my life. And I want to remind you of the two philosophies. There are two basic philosophies that run the earth. One is to endure your life. Endure the hard places and someday it will change. The other philosophy is to exit or escape where you are and go to a better place. I call it comfort and change philosophy will always believe something that helps us endure what we're going through. Endurance has its place. There are some things that you must endure for a season. But I'm a, a man really inclined to believe in change and that my decisions create my lifestyle. My decisions create my joy. I don't believe that God is responsible for my joy. He's the source of my joy, but not responsible for my joy. The Bible is a book about decisions, who to trust, what to change, what to focus on. I've seen times I wasn't hungry at all and passed by a billboard and suddenly... Yes. I was so proud of myself as I pulled into Tel Aviv Airport because I had limited my eating to just a little that day, and I was so proud of myself because I'm, I am making a serious effort to become skinny. Now, that's a dream to me bigger than anything you could imagine. And so... Brother Ron and I are walking through the airport, and I'm kind of proud of myself because I'm not really hungry. But I look through the airport, and there's a McDonald's. I said, Brother Ron, I just feel the Lord leading us over here to McDonald's because I could anticipate the taste of a Big Mac. We walked over there, and they had two. One was called... Mr. Texas? Was it Mr. Texas? Big Texas. That was the hamburger called Big Texas. And what was the other one called? Something. Big New York. Well, New York doesn't know anything about food. Let me tell you, it's like a Chicago hot dog. You might as well not eat them. But that Big Texas, I've never even seen it. Is it I, I, maybe I hadn't been to McDonald's lately here, but do they have it here? No, they have it in Israel, big Texas. I said, Brother Ron, get me two of those. They were bigger than my hand, bigger than my hand. 
bigger than my hand. It was like four Big Macs, maybe five, and a thousand times better. I sat there in that juicy. You know, there's a way that you can eat that it doesn't matter who's watching. It's dripping everywhere, but it's good. And it, Brother, it was the best hamburger I've had in my lifetime, in my lifetime. And I tried to slow down the eating so I would fill up quickly, you know. And it was phenomenal. Both of them were phenomenal. Couldn't believe I did that. All it took was a picture to excite me about eating. You're one picture away from a different feeling. I said, you are one picture away from a different feeling. That's almost a tweet, isn't it, Norisha? You are one picture away. One picture away from a different feeling. So always remember that when you feel bad. That's not your life. That's your feelings. A feeling is not your life. You may feel lonely. Nobody loves me. Nobody's thinking about me. Nobody cares. I could die and they wouldn't come see, see me for a month. But remember, that's a feeling. Oh, it's good to see you. All the way from Brazil, worship leader to great church. You go to Michael's church, Pastor Michael. But what a joy. I looked away and I said, I know her. What a joy to have you here. Very, very wonderful to have you. All the way from Brazil. Give her a big hand clap. Wave a hand. We're very thankful. Very thankful you're here. How do you improve your life in 24 hours? Because you can't. You've seen it happen. You've seen yourself on a downer that you didn't want to live another day. I've had days that I did not want to see another day. That I've, I've had days in my life where everything I had ever done, I felt like was foolish and stupid. Why had I done that? Why had I even written a book? It's not helping anybody. Why, how, and there's been other days that I felt like, wow, I got it together. Now, technically, nobody has it together. We just look like we have it together. There's nobody has it together. Nobody has it together. Everybody's got a part of their life that's in disorder. Everybody, everybody, I don't care who you name. Now, the best preachers on earth have some parts of their life that they're trying to work on. It may be one of their children who's away from God. And they go through this sorrow of spirit. Why can't my own son or why can't my own daughter make a change? Why do I live my whole life? And I poured myself into my children and suddenly they're different. They're changed. They're not responding to my influence. Now I want to respond. I want to just make sure that you realize you are, you are a secondary investor in your life. God was the first investor in your life. God sculpted you, created you, but you're number two. God has invested more in you than you will ever know, more than you will ever discover. And it's your responsibility to discover what God has invested in you. What gifts, what skills, what has God invested in you? When someone wants to start a company, they usually look for people who will invest. They lay out a plan. You can invest $10,000, $5,000, $50,000, and there's franchises where if you want to have the management of a, of a McDonald's, it may be half a million dollars or a million. It used to be, I remember when it was like 200000 And if you wanted to birth a McDonald's in your neighborhood, you would invest 200000 They had a system. They had a setup. Well, you are the CEO of your company. You are the owner of of your company. You are a corporation. You are a corporation. God has invested in you. You are the CEO, chief executive officer of your company. You're also the CFO, the chief financial officer of your company. But you are a company. People invest in you their energy, their time, their words, their information. They lend association to you to increase your credibility. But you must start seeing yourself as a company. You must see yourself as a company. You are the president of your company. You are a corporation. 
You invest time, you increase the worth of your company. We want to talk about today, how do you improve you, your life in 24 hours? I'm going to give you like a buffet. You don't have to do all of this today. When you go to a buffet, if you're like me, you really, really want all of it. And if I only eat one plate lunch at a buffet, I feel like they won. So I go back several times to feel like I got my money's worth. I'm ahead. Well, sometimes you can't eat all of it. So I'm going to give you some brief things that I think will improve a day. A number of years ago, about 20, 27 years ago, for two years I went on a fast of three days a week for two years, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. During that time, God spoke radically to me. And one of the things he showed me was that my day was like a train with 24 golden boxcars. 24 golden boxcars. And that any progress I made created pleasure. That every day you were given 24 golden box cars, and what you put in each box car determined the speed and the distance your train would move toward a destination. Now, life has three basic pleasures creativity, which is the beginning, progress, and a completion. Three different pleasures. Beginning, birthing, creativity. Birthing something excites you. That's why our future, when we talk about something we're going to create, something we're going to do, we get excited. And then we observe and evaluate any progress we're making. Then when we complete something, it's finished, we are at another level, another level of pleasure. Now, you want to identify what pleasures you what excites you. Remember that you should be, next to the Holy Spirit, the most important person in your life. And you must invest in yourself. If you take care of you, if I take care of me, I can take care of my father. If I take care of my mind, I can take care of my family. I can take care of others. Remember your personal importance. And do not make all of your investment in others because you're the CEO of your company. You are a company, which is the most important, an iPad or the Apple company? The Apple company. Without the Apple company, there would be no iPad, no iPhone, no iPod. So you want to see yourself as extremely important in your world. So you invest in you because the best gift you can give anybody is a happy you. The greatest gift you can give somebody is a happy you. Now, there's a famous saying, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. That's almost a scripture, isn't it? Let me look for a little tissue here. I said, it's almost a scripture. But you want to, to give attention to yourself because nobody is thinking about you all day. They're thinking about them. Even a critic, the only time they thought about you is when they criticize you. I'm interested in critics because I just think it's incredible that they think my life is more important than theirs. So we're going to take care of our mind. We're going to take care of our life. We're going to identify what pleasures us. Find the broken pieces in us because nobody arrives whole. Everybody arrives damaged. We all have missing parts. We all have missing pieces. There's not one of us here that doesn't have a missing piece in our life. And we spend our life looking for it, finding it, and we begin to improve our life through knowledge. And that's the purpose of knowledge is the ability to make changes. Now, what are changes? We're going to talk about a day because I feel like if you can't make a day go right, why are you trying to make your lifetime go right? Now, your life is today because tomorrow is already over or tomorrow has not started. Yesterday is already over. 
So watch this for a moment because it's very critical that you see this. Yesterday is over. Tomorrow is not here. So today is your life. Your lifetime involves yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But your life is a 24-hour period. So if I can't make one day, if I can't manage a day, I haven't managed my life. Now, since the life of God is in us, we are life. The life of God is in us. So someone, how, how's life treat you? What do you mean, how's life? How do I treat myself? Because I decide my successes. I decide my pleasures. My decisions create my life, my world. The Bible is a book about decisions. We're going to look at a 24-hour day. And how do I address this gift from God who is a servant to me? That day has been invested in me to see how I can prepare for the future, generate favor, launch favor. So God has planted and given me 24 hours to invest in my life. So a day is a divine investment in me. Today is a divine investment in me. If you cannot, I, I'm not a, a peddler of just hope. I believe that there's a plan we can implement. There are keys that we can use to make a day the highest level day because today is the seed for tomorrow. So my life today really matters. I'm not just trying to survive today. Today is life. It's, it's, it's my life. It's, it's here. What do I do with it? Turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And uh, you're going to really, really see changes, good changes in your life. Verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Say the perfect day. How many feel like if you can create a perfect day, you can do it twice? How many has ever seen days that were so good you felt like, wow, this is the closest thing to heaven I've ever had? Now, can you duplicate it? Of course. If you made one cake good, you can make a second one. How many feel like if the first cake was rotten, you need to study it and say, how can I improve this cake? Well, if my first day, if my day is not going, quote, going right, remember I'm the driver. I'm the driver. You're the driver of your life. God showed me that my life was like a 24-hour, 24 golden boxcars and what I put in boxcar 10 and boxcar 9 and boxcar 3 and boxcar 14 decided the speed I would move toward the next destination. Remember that life is a collection of goals. You have succeeded thousands of times. Success is the obtaining of something you want. Success is the obtaining of something you want. Success is an experience. It's not a time in your life. It's an experience. If you got something you wanted, you succeeded. How did your birthday go? Oh, it was wonderful. My friends came over and somebody gave me this and somebody gave me that. It was wonderful. So you succeeded. You had a success. You've already had many, many successes. Now you're wanting, I remember when I wanted places to preach. I remember that. Oh, boy, I just, oh, if I just had somebody, somebody opened the door, somebody invited me, somebody called me, I want to preach, I want to preach. And just the doors were not there. And I just, oh, somebody's to preach, oh, I, yay. Guess what? I just got invited. Now I'm wanting to stay home. It's a whole different, your desires will change. Your goals will continuously change. Your goals will continuously change. 
but you identify those goals. You write them down. You put pictures of them in front of you because you have the nature of God in you. You are a creator. This passion to obtain, this passion to produce is a God thing inside you. You cannot be delivered from that part of your life because you have the nature of God. A dog wants to bark and a thousand seminars won't change it. So you know that you have God's nature inside you. How can I make one day? Number one, identify the dominant goal of your day. Identify the dominant goal. Always identify the dominant goal. And that's what you believe if you succeed that day, that's the thing you need to succeed at. There's many things you'll do that day. You'll get dressed, you'll talk to friends, you'll go to church. But what's the dominant goal? What's the one thing every day that if you achieve it, the day was successful? Identify one. Oh, I've got 10. I know I've got 150. But what's the dominant goal of today? Don't try to live the future today. Don't pull tomorrow into today. When God finished his first day of creativity, he Bible said he looked at what he had done. So you know that one of the things you're going to have to do is learn how to celebrate a day. And at the end of that day, look over what you've accomplished. This is what I've done. This is why it's very vital that you document every small accomplishment to bring gratification. Remember, you're responsible for your pleasure. You're responsible for your pleasure. God's not responsible for your pleasure. You are. What has to happen today? for me to feel like this day was successful. I remember when I had some friends coming over. They were from out of the country, another country, and they were coming over to my house, and there was so much I had to do, and I thought, boy, I really, I really, I don't have time to stop here for two hours and take pictures and, and sign books and love on them and pray together, and oh, so glad you're here. I didn't really have time, but I looked over everything in my life, and I said, that's the dominant goal of today is to host these men of God who will probably never be in my house again. This is the dominant goal of today. Not the only thing I will do. Not the only thing I will complete, Pastor Dean, but it was the most important thing that day. That I become an Abraham who hosted God and two of the angels with him as they were en route to Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's whole goal that day was Abraham had a lot of responsibility, but he considered the hosting of these three to be very important. Dominant goal. Dominant goal. My dominant goal today, my dominant goal, I will teach on the Internet. I will make videos, seven minutes and two minutes. I will make video letters. I will do a host of things. I fly tomorrow to speak for Benny Hinn tomorrow night in Los Angeles. And, but that's tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, Brother Harold, God will give me the manna for tomorrow night. God hasn't given me anything for tomorrow night yet. Why? This is my day. That's right. That's his name, his program. And this is your day. So this is it. This is it. My dominant purpose today is to be with my family. And to look at you and look in your face and share with you ways that you can improve your life in 24 hours. Don't try to drag the past into today. Don't pull the future into today. Choose one thing a day that if you accomplish that, it has been an achievement. Just one thing. John Kluge, the billionaire, said something, and I think about it a lot because it's a weakness of mine. He said, I've seen as many people fail from attempting too many things as attempting too few. It is possible that in your attempt to live out and squeeze everything into a day, that every day you will feel the complexity of your life. And you will not taste pleasure. You will not... It's like swallowing food without the pleasure of eating it. 
Well, shoot, you want to taste that food. Well, tasting life, savoring the present. Choose one goal a day. One goal a day. Number two, view today as an investment of preparation for tomorrow. View today as it's an investment. Something you do today will create a reward tomorrow. Something you're doing today will birth favorable changes in your future. Give me one moment to... What you're doing today, you, you won't just reap today. Today's not a harvest. Today is only, today's a seed. So there'll be a lot of things you do today that won't pay off till tomorrow, the future. Today is an investment. Today is a, is a time that God has given you to invest in things that you will do today will not pay off today. They're long term. I've studied the life of Sam Walton pretty close. Any man that can give his children a billion apiece at his departure really is worth studying. He had five children, left them each a billion each. But he said, I never invest in a company for where it will be in two or three years. I study that company where it will be in 10 years. And if it is where... I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. Right and wrong. Evil and righteousness. Difference in people. Difference in a countenance. Difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom. Be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now. 
plant your seed of 300 and watch God move. Really is worth studying. He had five children, left them each a billion each. But he said, I never invest in a company for where it will be in two or three years. I study that company where it will be in 10 years. And if it is where I think it should be in 10 years, I study the progress. I study the decision making of the, of the leaders of that company. It's a long term. So today, part of today is a seed so that I will walk into the harvest a month from now. It'll be waiting for me. View today. This is not all the reaping day. Today's not all of it. It's a part. Three, name the theme of the day. Name the theme of today. My theme for today is healing. Healing the mind. Healing the sorrowful spirit in us. I name a theme every day. The day that all the preachers came over my house, I call that a day of hospitality. I did many things that day. I wrote checks, made, made a lot of things happen that day, but that was the theme of the day. Create a theme for every day of your life. Today will be a day of learning. Today is going to be a day of favor when I sow favor everywhere. Today's going to be a day of kindness. I'm going to, today, today's packaging is kindness. And there's going to be an anointing on me today for incredible kindness to others. And it's going to be a seed that I lavish into my environment. You name the theme of a day. What does this do? It does several things. First, it narrows your focus. It narrows your focus. You don't overlive the day. Have you ever had your house so messed up that you didn't know where to begin to clean it up? How many ever had your house so messed up? Have you ever heard somebody say, I don't know where to start? I don't know where to start. When you name the theme of a day, you immediately unclutter your mind. You unclutter your life. You unclutter your day. This is the focus of today. This is it. This is it. You can't make Wednesday decisions on Thursday manner. You cannot make a Wednesday decision on Thursday manner. God is distributing to you every day. He's giving you something fresh, something new. Even his mercies are new every morning, as you know. Are we on number five? Four. Is there an extra one, five? Oh, I didn't get, I missed one. Four, prophesy your day. Prophesy your day. I got up this morning and I sat on the edge of my bed and I began to prophesy my day. I began to tell my day what it was going to be like. This is how you're going to perform for me. This is what's going to happen. And you do it with your mouth. A thought is not a declaration. A thought is not prayer. Worry is not prayer. So I prophesied what my day would be like. This is what will happen at 11. This is what will happen at 12. And this is what's going to happen at 3. And this is what's going to happen. Hallelujah. Prophesy your day. I don't work for my day. My day's my servant. Prophesy your day. If you prophesy your day for 31 days, you're going to suddenly have a sense. I can let my, I can sculpture my life. Hallelujah. 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 Life is where you get to choose your own gifts. How many of you ever had people give you gifts that you couldn't use? Don't look at them. Just lift a hand. Gifts that you didn't like. I saw this, and I liked it so much, I bought it for you. Well, I don't want it. I don't like it. But life, God gives you a day to choose the gifts you can open that day. 
I prophesy my days. I was never taught that, never heard that. God began to stir me up. Prophesy your day. Tell your day what will happen. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know what the future holds. Well, what have you put in it? Five. Intercede for three people. And intercession don't mean you get lost and shake and fall. Intercession is just when you come into agreement with God for somebody's life. One person increases 10 times the strength of another. If I, which I did, I have pictures on my wall, and I prayed for specific people. I prayed for my brother this morning, my brother David. I prayed for my sister Flo. I prayed for my brother John. And I called them by name. They're pictures on the wall in my secret place. Now, I don't have to get lost. Oh, oh, oh. If God can create an entire universe with his mouth and he says, greater things than me you'll do. Now, Jesus said that. Jesus said, I would accomplish more than he did. Brother Mike, that's a little arrogant. It's a little scriptural. So all I have to do is say, Father, I'm an Abraham for my brother David. And I want you to unclutter his life of everything but his assignment and give him supernatural peace within him that he's making progress and reveal to him where he's making progress in his life. Did you know did you know that if I pray specifically for him, God sees me, hears my prayers, and said, okay. Instantly, the Bible says one will put a thousand enemies to flight, but two of us now put 10,000 enemies. So if he has 1,001 enemies, it'll be too much for his prayer life. He's only got enough faith for a thousand. But if I come over along beside of him, anything under 10,000 down is defeated in his life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if he gets 11,000 enemies against him in the spirit world, he's going to need a third of us. So you need Cindy. Say, I accept that. Isn't that powerful? Suzanne Wesley had 17 children. On day one of every month, she spent the entire day with one of her children, the oldest. Then day two, she would take the second oldest. And on the first 17 days of every month, she spent one complete day focused on that person. I think we're trying to do too much. I think you need to narrow down your focus for three people that day. I'm going to pray for three people a day. The next day, I may take three more. Next day, I take three more. But I know when I talk to God and request his involvement in a person's life, their life instantly, whew, a new anointing comes upon their life and a new grace comes upon them. Never trivialize the power of agreement. Six, the sixth way to improve your life in 24 hours is to accept the humanity in others. Accept the humanity, the humanness. The most godly man on earth has a human element, a human side. Look at Elijah. He could outrun chariots, run 35 miles an hour. But when he heard Jezebel was after him, he said, God, I'd like to die today. I want today to be my last day on the earth. Micah said, the best man on earth is like a thorn. Jeremiah had a different, he said, let me run a hotel in Arizona. You had, it's in your Bible. 
he said, let me run a lodging place, that's a hotel, motel, for wayfaring men in the desert. God, I'd rather run a motel than preach the rest of my life. He said that. If you'll accept humanity, every person here has a broken part in your life. All of us. I will accept that because you never get delivered from your humanity. 10,000 pastors can pray for you. They can put you in a bathtub of olive oil. And your humanity never leaves. It's what keeps us humble before the Lord. It's what keeps us reaching for God. It's what keeps us pursuing, helping each other. We must accept that. Your children, they're humans. They're humans. Daddy said something one day that really helped me. He said, when you realize how hard it is to change yourself, It gives you great compassion toward other people. We watch people, we watch on movies, people on cocaine or drugs, and we say, are they stupid? But then look at the problem you and I have with Cheez-Its. See, I sit there and look at the man with the cigarette, what's wrong with you? Don't you know that's going to kill you? I'm ordering two. Big Texas. I was trying to remember big, big or Mister. That really hits me a lot. Let me tell you, that hits me a whole lot. I sit there and I, I can think of something. How could this person do this? And then I realize the things that I am having to try to change in my life. I say, Wow, wow, that's their weakness. It's all a different weakness. I see men so proud of their wife, and I sit there and say, how could you be proud of being seen with her? But he is. You ever seen somebody proud of their mate, just hanging all over them? And you say, wow, they've been able to fantasize something I can't see. But that's, she was enough for him. He was enough for her. The humanity in us is deadly. It's what we constantly conquer. But if we accept that in others, that's a human being. We look at big shot people and famous people. I was watching Larry King interview Johnny Depp last night. All of us look like we've got it together. But there's a human part of us that we say, Lord, where did that come from? Why is that in me? Why am I having to deal with that? But it keeps us connected to God. Seven, decide to forgive everybody. It takes a load off of you. Picking which ones to forgive is stressful. Just decide to forgive everybody. Does that mean you suddenly become their best friend? No. Does that mean you trust them again? No. You forgive them. What does that mean? I will not penalize you for your sin. I will not penalize you for an offense. I will permit God to, to penalize you, but I will not be involved in penalizing you. Now, there's something else that wants to penalize anybody who offends us. I'll get you. I'll pay you back. Do you realize just coming up with a just coming up with a payback is is stressful? How am I going to pay them back? What's a way that I can retaliate? How can I how can I damage them without anybody knowing it? I think I think about that a lot. You think of slashing people's tires. You think, what time would I do it? What if somebody has a camera? There's always somebody walking around at night with a camera. What if somebody sees me and I don't see them? You can tell I watch some TV. And so I said, you know, so if you just say, 
I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. Does that mean you forget? No, that's a cute little phrase by do-goody people. When Joseph's brothers walked in the door, he didn't say, wow, I don't even remember you. What's your name? The Bible said he knew who they were. I think you remember. You remember pain. You remember offenses. That doesn't mean you haven't forgotten. But you forgive. I release you from my penalizing you for that offense. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It takes an incredible load off of you. Eight. Standardize parts of your day. Standardize parts of your day. There are things that you do every day, so standardize that. Maybe the time you go to bed. It may be that you wake up every morning, you fix cereal. But standardize parts of your day. That takes a load off. If you do something... Every week, standardize the week, the day that you, if you do something once a week, do it at the same time every day at that, at that time. The more you standardize parts of your life, the more joy you will have in the creative parts of your life. Standardize the parts of your life. I do a seven-day report. I like every Monday, I want a seven-day impact report. How did my television make an impact? How did my internet make an impact? I wanted an impact report. When I invested this, what was the outcome? I put energy over here. What was the outcome? Standardize the parts of your day that can be standardized. I remember when I created a mind map for my staff so they would know exactly what I wanted to eat every day. This is it. This is what I want on Monday. This is what I want on Tuesday. This is what I want on Wednesday. Standardize the parts of your life. Standardize the gift parts of your life. When you give gifts, decide what the gifts you're going to give to me. It may be a book. This is the book I love, and this is the book I'm going to give this year. Every time somebody has a birthday or they need a gift, this is the gift. And you standardize the parts of your life. Otherwise, you're constantly every day mixing it up. Standardize the parts of your life that can be standardized. Nine. Identify three things that will inspire you that day. Maybe a picture of somebody. You may have a picture of your child that every time you see it, you just start laughing. But find three things that inspire you. A picture. It may be a particular song. What gets you going? What unlocks you? It's different with everybody. They tell me that if you, and I believe them, that you need to be very careful of what's around you when you have an emotional experience because your trauma or traumatizing will connect everything around you. I can tell you where I was standing when I heard President John F. Kennedy was, was assassinated. I can tell you where I was sitting on a sofa in California when Princess Diana was killed in an automobile crash, and they showed it on television. I can tell you where I was sitting. Because anytime there's something traumatic that you hear and know, right now, you remember, there's a song goes out, if you don't know me by now, then you never, 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 never will know me. I can tell you instantly the girl I was dating at the time. Because I remember that song coming on when we were going through a problem in our relationship. If you don't know me by now, then you never, never will know me. And every time I hear that song, anywhere, anytime I, I'm back, exactly, I see her face all over again. Now, if negative things can make that impact, find the three things that excite you, the things that stir you, the things that unlock your energy. Ten. Journal three good things that happened that day. Not a chapter, just journal. Just journal three things a day that you felt good about. Maybe you stayed on schedule with something. Maybe, you, but just journal it. Journal three things. Don't have to be one sentence. Maybe you saw your your daughter and you hadn't seen her in six months, and she came over to the house, and. 
there was a love, a new love being rebuilt. You write that down. Just journal three things. Why? It unlocks a gratitude, and you begin to exude what's inside you. Oh, it improves your day. Something happens when you become, when you start journaling. Eleven, memorize one scripture. Try to master one topic in the Bible. If you're going to master the topic of love, then memorize 31 scriptures on love. But memorize one scripture a day. Why? His word contains faith. Twelve, excel. Eleven. Twelve, excel in love. Say that I will excel in love. Say it again. Say it again. If you excel in love, you have excelled in life. If you fail in love, you have failed in life. Write this down. Decide to sow and lavish favor into your environment. Decide to lavish favor into your environment. We're always talking about favor of the harvest, but it's seed that you get to sow. Seed guarantees the harvest. I wouldn't go through life. I don't. I just want favor from here, and I want favor. And, oh, I decree favor from the north to south. I sow favor. If I lavish favor into my world, the law of the harvest will catch up to me. Just make a decision. What do you do? I sow favor. That's what I do. Hallelujah. What do you need? What can I do for you? How can I help you? Favor, favor. Got time for a couple more? Invest seven minutes in the secret place. Invest seven minutes in the secret place. It removes the guilt. It makes you realize Satan can't use it against you, that you didn't pray that day, that you didn't spend time with the Holy Spirit. Just spend seven minutes. If God keeps you there longer, that's okay, but you do. Your part is invest seven minutes. Three things you want to do in the secret place. One is sing. Singing dispels darkness. The purpose of music is to change the mood. So sing to the Holy Spirit. Number two, be thankful. Express verbal thanks for anything God has given you and done for you. And three, ask for wisdom in your decisions. Hallelujah. First you sing. Then you thank him. And then three, you ask him for specific wisdom for something you're facing. Next is meditate on one topic. Meditate on one topic that day. The best Bible on earth to study, in my opinion, is the Seeds of Wisdom Bible, topical Bible, because we have 365. The topic for today is self-control. And if you look at that, it gives you all the scriptures for that subject. But choose one subject a day for your mind to be focused on. A different subject every day. And meditate on that. Meditate on that. Choose a subject. This is my subject today. Why? It instantly creates pleasure, progress. Write this down. Decide to be a reacher for one day. Decide to be a reacher. Do not wait for somebody to call you. Call them. So I, just want to, I was thinking about you. I want to pray for you. Decide to be a reacher. How to improve your life. Write this down. Limit your focus to your own territorial assignment. Limit your focus to your own territorial assignment. Do not get involved with the neighbor's kids. Keep your focus on your house. Do not go and visit other people to extract their problem zones. Say it aloud with me. I will stay in my territorial assignment. Say it again. 
Say it again. Write this down. Rest. Rest is the seed for honor. Or the seed for, excuse me. Rest is the seed for hope. God considered the seventh day equal to every other day that he, that he created. Look what God could do in one day. But on day seven, he says there's something equal to everything else I've created, and that's rest. Rest. Many marriages would improve if they simply got enough rest. Many relationships would change if they simply got enough rest. If you go to my blog on our website, you'll notice I wrote about that this week. Rest is your seed for change. You're a very different person when you're rested than when you're not. Two people, Dwight D. Eisenhower and President Bill Clinton, and also three, because President Bush said the same thing, that all their bad decisions could be traced to a day they were too tired. President Eisenhower said he would never make a major decision past 3 o'clock every day. Why? Fatigue births bad decisions in your life. When you're tired, you make wrong decisions. If you want to improve a day, get yourself restored. How many has ever woke up in a whole different mood than you went to bed in? Because rest is a healer. Rest is a healer. Rest is a restore. Say this aloud, I will improve my days. Would you stand with me? Say it again, I will improve my days. Aloud, I will improve my days. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment, like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet telling others about it and I hope you're getting by the way I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your mp3 every single day two minutes of wisdom be a blessing sometimes I go a little over because I get excited I want you to be a part of this ministry I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive, I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. 
when I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.